Hello again. Um, welcome back to the second screencast of um, the Punk and Riot Girl um, modules uh, for rock music number two. Um, in this lesson, we'll be talking about the Riot Girl movement. Uh, we'll think about its history briefly. We'll think a little bit about hardcore punk. Um, and we'll definitely be thinking about femininity and gender. Um, so let's start with thinking about the origins of Riot Girl. Um, it occurred uh, early 1990s in the USA. It's, uh, it, it is said to have um, commenced at a university in Washington State. And it was said to have commenced, I mean, I don't know if this is myth or not, um, but I read um, that it was said to have commenced when uh, a group of women were keeping a list on the wall in the bathroom, so they were writing in the bathroom, a list of, um, you know, college guys who were notorious for date raping women, um, and that this, you know, inevitably developed into um, other things, fanzines, um, and a whole bunch of other stuff, including the music. So notable right girl bands, Bikini Kill, Huggy Bear, Babes in Toyland, Heavens to Betsy, um, you may have heard of some of those, and there's many others. Um, it's almost an exclusively female movement, hence the name. Uh, there are men who do participate, but they are in the minority, uh, at least in terms of playing the music, anyway, I'm talking about. Um, so it's an almost exclusively female movement, hence the name. So Riot Girl, uh, there's lots of stories about how this terminology came about, but um, you know, riot because they the women were aggressive and they wanted to challenge these feminine norms and they really did want to create a riot in the true sort of punk-esque sense of the term. Uh, and the word girl, because, uh, you know, the girl captures the girl in aggression, uh, but also because they wanted to reclaim the term girl um, in, you know, traditional notions of um, patriarchy, it's, it's kind of around puberty that uh, when, when girls undergo the change from being uh, girls to women that we become more self-aware and self-conscious of our bodies and it's when those kinds of, at least you know, in, in the eyes of right girls, it's when these kinds of really damaging uh, ideas come to take hold in women. So they wanted to reclaim the idea of the girl and they wanted to take us back to um, that moment in a girl's life when she doesn't really care about or perhaps she isn't aware about those kinds of pressures and stereotypes and norms that are, you know, we are supposed to live up to in the same way that men are supposed to live up to their stereotypes as well. So the music is um, predominantly a pro-women music and it has a relationship with third wave, third wave feminism, although this is not a cohesive relationship. Some women, uh, some participants of Riot Girl obviously accept uh, third wave feminism, some fundamentally refute feminism completely. So um, the music is often positioned as being a feminist music and um, that's not necessarily untrue, um, but it's difficult to say that um, it's in, you know, inherently associated with these kinds of movements because everybody has their own opinions on these kinds of things. But again, we need to ask, you know, whose history is this? This is obviously uh, predominantly a white history. Again, uh, all of these women uh, are predominantly white women uh, and it's university origins. This means that they were white women with, you know, some kind of money, some kind of social status. Um, so it's kind of a, you know, a form of music that is, is in, in the same way that the other forms of music we've discussed, a very kind of white privileged kinds of music. And we need to keep that in mind when we're talking about these things. Um, so let's think now a little bit about gender stereotypes. We spoke about gender stereotypes, uh, masculine gender stereotypes in the last lecture series on heavy metal music. And I want to think about now these stereotypes in relation to women. Um, the way that we often think about gender is uh, as a binary system. So gender is a kind of semiotic system that occurs, uh, a, a system of meaning, I mean, um, and that system of meaning often functions uh, through oppositions. So that means that, um, you know, under this system of um, gender stereotypes, the masculine stereotypes rely on the feminine stereotypes, on issuing the feminine stereotypes, 
and the feminine stereotypes rely on the masculine stereotypes as a point of difference. So for example, um, uh, so some feminine stereotypes are, you know, that uh, this focus on the body, that women are often objectified in the media, we're often considered um, for the way that we look, we're often uh, spoken about in terms of the way that we look, and this is contrasted against, you know, the, um, the notion of logic and intellect are, are held by men or that is supposed to be held by men. In other words, um, body versus brains. Um, other stereotypes are that women are supposed to be weak, and this is contrasted with men who are supposed to be strong and they're supposed to save us. Um, they're the heroes and we need to be saved. Uh, emotional versus logical, so women are supposed to be uh, more emotional and men are supposed to be more logical. We're supposed to be more nurturing, um, you know, due to the fact that we give birth and, and because of our relationship with our body, women menstruate, women give birth, so women are often perceived of in terms of, you know, their body and in terms of their physical characteristics. Uh, and this nurturing quality links in with that, that because we are, um, you know, able to give birth, that means we are therefore inherently nurturing and inherently caring. Um, the idea that we're supposed to be passive, you've probably heard the saying, women are supposed to be seen and not heard. Um, so, you know, according to gender stereotypes, women aren't supposed to have opinions, they're supposed to sit there and look pretty while the men um, do the thinking and the talking. And of course, you know, the quintessential um, housewife, the domestic duties, who stays home, looks after the kids, cooks dinner, cleans the house while the man goes out and works and earns money. Uh, and you can see the little picture that I've um, posted here, uh, the male brain and the female brain, which, you know, again, draws on these kinds of gendered stereotypes. And I just sort of wanted to remind you that um, these are stereotypes that are held as ideals. They're not obviously characteristics that every woman and every man are seen to possess. Uh, I also wanted to point out the sort of, um, uh, you know, um, the kind of nature of these stereotypes, the restrictive nature of these stereotypes means that they sort of only afford particular roles for women and men and in that way um, gender stereotypes are, you know, equally bad for women as they are for men um, and quite often, um, you know, they're very restrictive and they're very difficult and they're held as ideals and they're, you know, they don't really make sense when you break it down and think about it. Um, this capacity for aggression in the right girl movement. Um, so uh, I wanted to sort of think about this a little bit because women are not considered to be aggressive creatures. So this is um, often spoken about in, you know, in the discourse of right girl movement, this notion of aggression. And I wanted to sort of flag it um, as a thing um, because uh, though the right girl movement the right girl movement was pro-women, it doesn't mean that it was anti-male. Uh, in some respects it was, as a response to the sort of really violent and aggressive hardcore punk scene, but men were included in gigs and bands, men were included to attend, um, men were included to play, however their inclusion was regulated on the basis um, or, uh, you know, to forego women's, um, women's enjoyment of the music. So, for example, um, it's often said that at Bikini Kill gigs, they would section off a, a, a section at the front, you know, specifically for women, so that the girls could be up the front, the girls could be slam dancing, they didn't get hurt, they didn't get injured, they weren't subject to, um, you know, any kinds of harassment from the men. And often gigs were stopped uh, in the middle of songs um, simply because men were, not all men, obviously, some men were perceived to be being aggressive or to be um, harassing the women and so um, this is kind of a common um, feature of the music that this kind of aggression is um, directly towards men but it's not necessarily. Um, so this pro-women attitude is often constructed as musical aggression but it's directed towards our patriarchal society in the same way as punk music is so it's not necessarily directed specifically at men, it's more about the sort of gender structures and the roles that these structures afford for women in the same way that punk music was of, you know, um, the music of the late 70s and early 80s, in the same way that that music was a rejection of the sort of norms and stereotypes 
our right girl wants to respond to those in relation to women. <coughs> Um, so I wanted to sort of flag this idea that it's, it is problematic to read this aggression as anything other than a part of the punk paradigm more broadly. So uh, critics and academics often pick up on this point of aggression and it becomes a thing. Oh, the riot girls were aggressive. Um, <clears throat> and because it's unusual uh, for women to be seen as being aggressive in the context of this stereotypical gender matrix, um, it's often kind of a tokenistic gesture. Um, but if you think about the context of punk and the context of hardcore, punk is inherently uh, about aggression anyway. So for us to pick up on um, aggression as a theme in Riot Girl music could be, you know, kind of problematic. It, we could be separating out gender um, by doing that, when really it's, it could also be seen as just a part of the music. So I'll leave that one for you to think about and, and to see where you stand on that issue. So the Riot Girls were, um, you know, responding to this sort of hardcore scene and this hardcore scene developed in reaction to that late 70s, early 80s punk music which was seen as sort of um, a kind of a privileged punk music um, in that it was, you know, a lot of these um, punk musicians went, attended art school and it was kind of seen as bohemian and, um, you know, a bit avant-garde. And that didn't really reflect the, um, you know, the opinions and values of the marginalised youth of the suburbs. So it was kind of this highbrow punk music, and so hardcore punk wanted to respond to that, uh, and it wanted to respond to this sort of uh, fashion orientated goals of punk, of early punk anyway, um, where we saw, you know, punk sort of refusing these social norms and social standards, and, and sort of adopting these um, scrubby looking you know clothes or you know crazy uh, mohawk hairstyles with different colors so the hardcore punks felt that this was kind of um you know antithetical to the to the values of punk music more broadly so punk music was all about issuing these societal standards when really it became this kind of focus on you know the way that you look and the way that you act um, in, in a sense creating new stereotypes and new norms um, so that's kind of seen as selling out in many respects. It's, it's not authentic, you know, because it becomes about the costuming and the performance of punk. Um, so the hardcore punks were responding to that. And the way that they responded to that, of course, was to have, uh, you know, more, 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 more harder, more, 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 more faster music. So it's, it's funny to me that, you know, as we progress through history, the claims about who has the hardest music is kind of, um, is a little bit funny to me. But hardcore punk is a lot faster um, than traditional punk. Uh, the songs are typically shorter, the lyrics are screamed, um, so to the point where you often, you know, well more often than not, can't understand the lyrics. Um, the lyrics are explicitly violent um, and, you know, often kind of offensive. Um, they deal with, you know, not just little bits of violence, they deal with sort of extreme violence and explicit violence. Uh, and, and brutality as well, um, and that's often um, seen at gigs, you know, uh, that the gigs were often really, really violent gigs. So some, you know, hardcore bands that you might know of, Anti-Flag, Discharge, The Dead Kennedys, Napalm Death, I'll obviously put some of these examples for you to listen to, um, and we can make some comparisons, and I'll put those into the module, obviously. So um, this sort of hardcore punk then was seen as kind of this hyper, hyper masculine, um, you know, scene and music. Um, and, and this quote sort of embodies that. It says, hardcore made it more like a sporting event than music with the worst jocks you've ever seen. It excluded women. It became exclusionary only because it was violent. People couldn't handle the physicality. Punk dancing was pretty safe more communal, almost kind of retarded. With hardcore, there are a lot more boots flying in the air than tennis shoes, a real aggressive connotation to it. It replaced the arty stuff with an injection of extreme energy, to the point where being a faster band was the equivalent of playing a faster guitar solo in the 70s. So this sort of, um, there's a, a, a few things here really, is this idea that hardcore punk was this kind of super hypercharged masculine music and it was kind of a place where kind of became a you know a blokey place where dudes can hang out and um, I guess bond in their violence 
Um, and it became exclusionary on that basis because it was so violent. Women, you know, simply physically couldn't compete with that and it wasn't safe for them to be around this music. Um, and, and that's interesting in relation to punk, you know, uh, or the earlier forms of punk, which was kind of, even though it was a little bit sort of, um, you know, there was mayhem, there was anarchy, there were riots, it wasn't directly physically unsafe for women. It was unsafe for everybody. Um, whereas in this context, this was actually physically unsafe for women to be a part of this music. There's also this idea of it, um, hardcore punk replacing the arty stuff. So the arty stuff is seen as kind of the more, um, you know, refined version of punk music. Whereas this is the, hardcore is the punk of the lower classes, you know, or the underclasses. Um, and in that respect, it's not, it's, you know, it doesn't have those same kinds of polished, or not polished, that's not the right word, but it doesn't have the same kinds of qualities. It's a lot more dirtier um, and sort of a lot more, um, you know, uh, violent and aggressive and, and fast, I guess. Um, so this kind of, um, you know, riot girl music was a direct response to this hardcore punk scene where women physically couldn't attend the music. It became so violent, it became so aggressive and misogynistic, uh, also homophobic, um, that it wasn't safe for anyone other than straight white men to participate in the scene. Um, so uh, a quote here cited um, in the Bok book, incidentally this book, I'll link to it, uh, is a really interesting book if you're interested in the Riot Girl movement. Um, but cited in that book, um, Jennifer Miro of the band The Nuns, she says, it became this whole macho anti-women thing. Then women didn't go because they were afraid of getting killed. I didn't even go because it was so violent and so macho that it was repulsive. So again, there's kind of these, you know, if you want to listen to hardcore punk music, you can't go and listen live as a woman um, because you're physically threatened. Um, so it becomes extremely dangerous for women to participate in music. And therefore, this kind of right girl movement was cultivated around that as a response to this kind of inherent misogyny of the music. So in that case, if hardcore music enabled young suburban men to express their anger and aggression at the world, then the riot girl movement enabled young suburban girls to express their anger and aggression at the boys. Um, and in this response, um, the music of the riot girls directly engaged with the musical aggression enacted by hardcore punks. Um, and, and this sort of occurs deliberately in opposition to their femininity, right? So the music is inherently masculine because of its sort of speed and its aggression and its violence. And that's the very reason why the girls, the punk, uh, sorry, the riot girls wanted to engage with that music on those terms. They wanted to take that, even though they knew it was in opposition to their femininity, they wanted to take that and use that uh, as a tool to sort of um, cultivate a more woman-friendly environment. This is a common theme for uh, the riot girls. They often chose to reclaim elements that were opposing femininity. Um, and you'll see uh, events like the, I think it's called the slut walk or something like that, um, <clears throat> you know, that sort of evolved out of this kind of music. So they would take um, derogatory, sexist and misogynistic terminology and they would sort of reclaim it for themselves. Uh, and this is what we see happening in, with the terminology, the riot girl movement, um, but also the scene, you know, this sort of hardcore scene as being exclusively male. Um, and, you know, at the same time, sort of this juxtaposition of those sort of um, nasty, gritty elements against their own femininity and girlhood. So it's kind of this um, contrast of taking these misogynistic elements and, and you know, um, superimposing them onto their, onto themselves as they are reclaiming, you know, what it means to be a girl without those kinds of um, nasty stereotypes and nasty sort of self-conscious, you know, body issues and all of that kind of stuff. So the music of the Riot Girls is very much um, punky if you listen to it, um, and I'll obviously link to some examples. Um, and it sort of engages with this DIY ethos, this do-it-yourself ethos, um, you know, on a really broad level. So the, the Riot Girls regularly communicated via fanzines, um, which were often distributed at gigs. Um, I already mentioned to you where they section off um, parts of the, 
um, you know, the dance floor for women to engage in slam dancing. They would distribute um, these little uh, self-made um, brochures um, at gigs, uh, explaining to women that they wanted the women to be up the front and the guys to stand at the back. Um, and this, they also allowed fans to participate in music making during the gigs, so that they would often call girls up on stage to sing or to participate, or they'd hand the microphone around. <coughs> excuse me for women to speak about their experiences with violence and, and male violence in particular. So the lyrics this means are almost explicitly covering women's issues and definitely women's subjectivities and women perspectives on the world. Uh, and this often includes violence towards women. So, um, you know, much like the other kinds of, um, you know, punk music, including hardcore, um, the lyrics are kind of often confronting. They're not um, you know, they're not pretty little lyrics, they're definitely confronting, they're definitely aggressive, they definitely um, have sensitive themes in them, and that's deliberate. Um, they cover sexual abuse, they cover violence towards women, um, issues of incest, incest. Um, yeah, so the, the lyrics are kind of, can be, you know, disturbing for some, which I'll highlight to you now when you go and listen to the music, if you choose to listen to it. I'll try and keep the examples clean, but I'll give you content warnings. Um, so just another quote here, the abuses of girls and women's bodies are constantly represented by riot girls both in their music and zines. Since such abuses are generally associated with women's alienation from their bodies, the ability to be embodied, the development of the body in performance, provides an antidote to its previous violations. So this means that the music is um, uh, enacted upon women's bodies, that the body uh, is central to this particular kind of music in the way that women's bodies are in space. Um, you know, both as a reaction to this notion of the body, uh, women being judged on their bodies and being objectified, but also as a place to kind of um, subvert that idea that, you know, we are reclaiming our bodies, um, that kind of idea. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. And uh, I'm going to let you go and explore some of the music now, and I'll give you some things to think about within the context of the module. Um, thanks for having me broadly. Um, I've enjoyed giving you these last two uh, lectures on rock music, and um, yeah, have fun exploring the module.